fantastic. I wasn't sure he was going to be here. Um, so welcome everybody to the RISE conference. I think I said about a year ago, or maybe not quite even a year ago, uh, that this was the last RISE conference, and it turned out not to be. This is this really is, though, the last RISE conference. And I'm enormously grateful to our funders, FCDO, who have given us a little bit more money after the end of the RISE program to be able to continue our work um, for a further six months, including this conference. And what we're doing um, over these next two days is really talking through all of the themes that we've addressed during the past eight years of RISE. So you'll see that the program spans a big range of themes. We're starting today with two sessions on teachers, the first about recruitment, placement and motivation. Then we take a break for half an hour and then we come back and we have a session on uh, training and support. We are gonna be ruthless with time. We really, we've got so many papers being presented, we have to stick to time. So UAE is gonna chair the next session and she is gonna keep all of our speakers to 15 minutes and we will end at 10.30. Okay, thank you. From the thematic synthesis team at RISE focusing on teachers and management and now I'm a senior education specialist at the What Works Hub for Global Education. So I'm very excited about this panel. Um, we are going to have four speakers. We'll start with Maria Lombardi. On, oh, just a minute. <laughs> That's right, Maria. <laughs> That's fine. And Maria will be talking to us about a change in the law in Chile that led to permanent contracts for a lot of teachers that have been previously holding temporary contracts. Then we're going to go to Gregory Alacqua will be talking about a new administrative platform in Ecuador that gave teachers personalized information um, at the point of ranking the schools that they prefer to get placed in. And then we're going to go to Ricardo Estrada on Mexico, where he's talking about a nationwide scale up of a teacher selection mechanism that replaced a previous discretionary selection mechanism for getting teachers into the pool. And after that, we're going to go online and to India to Jalnith Kaur, who's going to be talking us through a psychosocial teacher training intervention that tried to change teachers' beliefs about how much they can influence the classroom. Um, so the one thing I wanted to say in framing this panel is that what I find both really important and really challenging in thinking about this set of papers is trying to hold in my head that all these things, so, you know, selection, allocation, contract structure, training, or the lack thereof, happen to the state each teacher in each education system concurrently. And so by extension, they affect every child in every classroom concurrently, right? Um, and in good Lant Pritchett fashion, I tried to come up with a pithy metaphor, emphasis on the tried. So, you know, I was thinking, you're trying to manage or design a teacher whole career structure. It's sort of like, let's say you're given like a plot of land or a field and you're told, okay, your job is to cultivate a garden or an urban forest that can be a habitat for local wildlife. Um, the metaphor got really complicated really quickly, apart from the obvious fact that children are clearly not wildlife. You know, we have things like, okay, I'm going to come up with the best plants and figure out where to allocate them to the best place. But then all of a sudden, you learn there's a scary cartel of plant nurseries who say, no, 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 half your teachers need to come from my saplings or I will get politicians involved. Or, you know, there's also the much more important fact that the plants in this analogy have agency, right? teachers shaped by their circumstances can decide to some extent whether they want to channel more of their nutrients toward growing nice shady leaves or beautiful flowers or thorns or some plants after years and years of not getting enough nourishment and seeing local wildlife habitat numbers stagnate. They might just lose hope and decide there's no point and kind of just hang out there and wither. So, Moving on from the very stretch metaphor to the actual careful research, the point is that, you know, the kinds of teacher preferences about where there's, which schools they go to that um, Gregory is going to talk to us about are shaped by the incentives and the contract structures they face, right, which Maria is going to talk about, and teachers' beliefs about what they can and can't change in their classrooms, as John Nitt will be telling us about, are shaped by the selection mechanisms that shape the pool of teachers, which Ricardo is talking about. So, I hope that in our Q&A, we'll be able to get into some of these interactions. As Claire said, we're doing this in typical RISE conference panel session. So 15 minutes strict on time. And then after that, we'll take a few rounds of questions. So hold your questions to the end. We'll be very excited about them at that point. So now, Maria, we are so pleased to have you come up here. time. So the, this paper is on the impact of giving high dismissal protection to teachers and it's co-authored with Ricardo Estrada over there. 
So let me just start by saying that job stability is like a very common feature in many public sector jobs, including teaching, which is what I'm going to talk about. And this in practice means that it's very, very hard to fire people when they're not doing a right job. So it's restricted to very exceptional circumstances. And even though this is such a common thing, we know very little about its consequences. So one can think about the impact of high dismissal protection on the quality of education as being a good thing or a bad thing. So on the one hand, giving people high dismissal protection prevents us from having excessive turnover, which has a lot of switching costs associated to it. That's a good thing. Also, it will increase the appeal of teaching for people who have good outside options, thereby improving the pool of teachers. And finally, one can think that knowing that the contractual relationship will have a long standing horizon, this gives incentives both to teachers and to schools to invest in like job specific attributes. So, of course, all of these things come at a cost. The main cost associated with this is that once you make a bad hiring decision, this has very high costs because you cannot fire people unless it's a very, very extenuating circumstance. Also, just people don't have incentives to perform on the job if they know they're not being able to, not going to be fired, thereby worsening the productivity of teachers. And finally, something that we're not talking about in this project, but it's an interesting thing to think about, is that having high dismissal protection gives less flexibility to the educational system to adapt its teaching workforce to changes in the demand for education across disciplines or geographical areas. So in this paper, we look at the impact of high dismissal protection on turnover and productivity of teachers. And we're going to look at this in the context of public school teachers in Chile. And this is important to, uh, to keep in mind once looking at the results. We're going to be focusing on dismissal protection that is granted on the basis of seniority and not on performance, which is actually a very common thing that, that occurs in many educational systems. So for identification, we're going to use a law that was enacted in 2015, which mandated that educational administrators grant a permanent contract to teachers that had a temporary contract and a minimum level of seniority by, by the previous year. And because there were teachers who were affected and unaffected by this law, we're going to use a typical differences in differences estimation, comparing the outcomes of these two groups of teachers. So before I go into the estimation and the, and the results, let me just tell you a bit about the educational sector in, in Chile. Public education, at least in the moment in which we were studying this question, was run by municipal governments. There's 300 and something municipalities. And the municipal governments can hire teachers under two types of contracts. Permanent contracts, which are your typical civil servant teachers, and temporary contracts. Permanent teachers are hired through a competitive process whereby the municipalities have like a, they receive direct applications and they have a panel of evaluators that look at the, at the applicants whereby te temporary teachers are directly hired by direct appointment. There's no like competitive process associated with this. An important thing is that their contracts, they can last up to two years, but they typically last for one year, for the entire school year. This can be renewed though, and in many cases they are. And um, like what happens in many countries here, both types of teachers have the same working conditions, the same salary, they do the same job. The main difference lies in the protection they have against dismissal. Basically, temporary teachers, once their contract runs out, it can, it can not be renewed and thereby they don't receive any uh, severance pay. This is the main thing between these two types of teachers. Other than that, they face the same working conditions. And even though the law in Chile caps the share of temporary teachers at 20%, compliance is low. In particular, right before the reform we're going to look at, 59% of teachers had a temporary contract. This had been going up for the previous years for different reasons that we look at in, a, in another project. And of course, as you can imagine, this was not, uh, this met some resistance from the main people affected by this, which were the teachers. Here you can see people who are saying, uh, no more teachers a contrata, which is like temporary teachers. And this led to the policy that we're gonna look at, which happened in January of 2015, here in the Southern, here now there in the Southern Hemisphere, the school year starts in March. So this was right before the start of the school year. And Congress forced municipal governments to give a permanent contract to some teachers that had a temporary contract. Who were affected by this? Where it covered those by, that by mid 2014, so in the previous school year, had been working in the same municipality for at least three consecutive years or four non-consecutive years. So this was completely seniority based. 
And a year of experience counted as long as you were working at least 20 hours, which is most of the teachers were, were full-time teachers. And almost a third of K-12 teachers with a temporary contract were covered by, by this law. And an important thing to bear in mind is that this was a one-off event. It's not that this changed the way in which you can progress from a temporary contract to a permanent contract. It was just a one-off thing to regularize an irregular situation, but then things went back to normal after, after this regularization process. And also an important thing to bear in mind is that the way to think about this is once the law was passed, those who were eligible for this dismissal protection had protection against dismissal, even though their contractual status may have taken a little time to adjust because of just some bureaucracy associated with it. Let me see, okay. So first of all, I'm gonna look at the impact on turnover. Basically, who is retained when you give them dismissal protection? To do this, we're gonna take advantage of the nice data that we have in Chile. We're gonna use a database that has every teaching position in Chile since 2003, both in the public and the private sector. And importantly, this database has the characteristics, oh, sorry, and the characteristics of the teaching position, the number of contract hours, and the type of contract. And we have a teacher identifiers that allow us to track teachers across years and positions. So this allows me two things. One, to identify who are the teachers who are eligible for this dismissal protection under this law. And also it allows me to look at what happens after teachers are giving dismissal protection. We can look at turnover and we can look at movements across different types of schools in the, sector, in the educational sector. And because we don't only care about retention, but we also care about who is being retained as a result of this dismissal protection, we want to look at heterogeneous effects across a dimension of teacher ability. What we can do in this context is look at teacher evaluation results, which were being held on a regular basis. And this is gonna be a measure of teacher ability that we're gonna explore to see heterogeneous effects. So our sample is gonna consist of public school teachers that in each year between 2010 and 2014 had exactly two or three years of consecutive experience in the municipality and had a temporary contract. So here we have a repeated cross-section of teachers. In each year, I'm gonna look at those that have or three or two years of consecutive experience. Those with three years of consecutive experience are our treatment group, and those with two years of experience are our comparison group. And the cohort in which we have differences between these two types of teachers in their dismissal protection is a 2014 cohort. So using this sample, I'm gonna run a very simple difference, differences estimation. My outcome variable is gonna be a dummy for whether this teacher is not working in the same school after one or two years. My treatment dummy is what I showed you before, equals to one if the teacher had three years of consecutive experience in their municipality under a temporary contract in that year, and zero if they had two years of experience. And I'm gonna interact this with a dummy for the 2014 cohort, which as I told you, is a cohort for which we have a difference in these two types of teachers in whether they had access to this dismissal protection. So now I'm gonna show you my treatment dummy, the, the, my coefficient of interest, this beta two, for these two outcomes not being in the same school after one and after two years. So we, what you can see here is that dismissal protection leads to a large reduction in teaching turnover, teacher turnover, basically seven percentage points after two years, which, which is a 25% reduction over the control group mean. And teachers could turn over by either not being in the public education system or taking a job in another public school. So we break down this, this turnover, looking at what would have happened in the counterfaction. And we can see that two thirds of this reduction in turnover is driven by teachers who, in the absence of dismissal protection, would have been working and would, would not have been working in the public school system. So I don't have these results here, but basically we see that teachers uh, are prevented from working in private schools and from quitting teaching altogether once they receive dismissal protection. The reminder comes from a lower probability of taking a job in another public school. So basically, just over five years. Perfect, thank you. And because we don't care about turnover just in general, but we also want to know who are we retaining as a result of this, I'm going to interact this regression with dummies for a teacher's baseline a teaching evaluation results. So here you can see the impact of dismissal protection for teachers in the first, second, and third tercile in a teaching evaluation conducted before this policy was in place. 
And we find a statistically significant reduction in turnover for teachers at the bottom and top of the distribution of teaching performance. So to speak very crudely, we're retaining the bad and the good teachers when we give them dismissal protection. So basically the average quality of teachers, at least in this context, is unchanged. So I'm gonna just spend the last minutes that I have talking about what happens on, with student learning, which is of course the outcome we, we, that we care the most about. We're gonna proxy teacher productivity using value, value added to student achievement. In particular, we're gonna use math and literacy scores from a nationwide standardized test that all kids take at the end of sixth grade. And again, we're gonna use this 2015 law as an exogenous shifter in the probability of having dismissal protection. Once again, a difference is in differences estimation comparing the students of treated teachers with the other teachers, those that did not have their dismissal protection status changed in 2015. A potential concern here, and every time that we're looking at a policy that affects teachers is that you could have sorting to treated teachers in the year in which the policy takes place. So for example, if the best students are assigned to treated teachers in 2015, we might think that dismissal protection is wonderful, where in fact, it's just a change in the composition of the student body. So we take advantage of the fact that in sixth grade, almost the majority of kids have a different teacher in math than they do in language. So some kids are treated in one subject, but not in another. And so we're gonna use a within student across subject estimation, and it's unlikely that sorting is subject specific. So I have like three minutes left. Let me just quickly say that I have two observations per student, one in math, one in language. And I'm gonna compare kids that have a change in the status of the dismissal protection of their teachers in one subject, but not in another. And in some estimations, I'm gonna include a teacher fixed effect where what I'm gonna look at is for the same teacher, what happens when they change their, their dismissal protection status across time. As you can see here, on average, we find no effect on student learning. In particular, we can reject a drop in test scores larger than 4.6% of a standard deviation, and we can reject an increase larger than 1.2% of a standard deviation. But once again, this could be masking some heterogeneous effects going on. It's not obvious that all types of teachers are gonna react the same way when they're giving dismissal protection. So what we do is we interact this estimation once again with the performance at baseline of teachers in their teaching evaluation. And what we find, so here what you can see, or you can see, I don't know how big this is, we have the treat, treatment times post dummy interacted with the uh, tercile or a uh, position in the, in the distribution of teachers in their baseline evaluation. And what you can see in the second column is that once we include teacher fixed effects, so once we keep the pool of teachers fixed, we find that there's a negative effect on student performance for a students that have teachers with low baseline uh, teaching evaluation scores. So the way to think about this is that once you grant dismissal protection, teachers with ha that have a low baseline performance, they perform less effort. And we have some direct evidence of that that I don't have time to, to show you now, uh, but that's the main mechanism that, that we find. And so, to sum up, how am I doing? I'm okay. Uh, we find that granting permanent contracts on the basis of seniority, and this is an important qualifier, leads to a large reduction in teaching turnover throughout the distribution of teacher quality. And we also find a decline in student learning for students of teachers with low baseline performance. So the way to think about this is that high dismissal protection is a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it allows you to retain teachers that have good outside options and would have otherwise left the public school system and perhaps also the teaching profession, but it has a cost that it makes it more, diffi more difficult to separate low performing employees and to mot motivate them as well. And an obvious conclusion that one can think about when looking at this is why did they grant dismissal protection based on seniority and not on performance, which is something that they had been measuring for a long while. This like a political thing, I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but it's a good question to think about. Right? So, I'm good with time. Thank you very much. No problem. This is some work that we've been conducting in Ecuador with uh, with Chris Nielsen at Yale and at the at the IDB. I'll get right into it. So making optimal choices. Let me let me set my time as well. I hope I'm, hope I'm as good as the previous presenter. <laughs> uh, making optimal choices is very difficult when faced with information frictions. And there's 
a growing body of evidence that providing agents, individuals with personalized information can facilitate the decision-making process. Inter uh, informational interventions are potentially beneficial at the individual and at the system, at the efficiency level. So we're gonna show some of this today. There has been uh, a, a, an emerging body of evidence on uh, using inter informational interventions and in, uh, school choice in Chile, there's some work and also in Pakistan, financial choices, healthcare plan, different healthcare plans, consumer behavior. And most of these studies show that low cost and they have these interventions are low cost and have a positive impact on the decision-making process, but the devil is in the details in most of these programs. So we explore the role of information in teacher job markets. We look at uh, Ecuador's system. Uh, teachers, and this is, we've done a lot of work on this in Latin America and different countries, and I know the previous, uh, Ricardo and, and, and uh, Maria, right? Maria have also looked at this uh, in Mexico and some other places. In, in, at least in Latin America and in other developing countries and regions, teachers face a, an opaque and, and very limited transparency with regarding teacher openings when they apply for vacancies. Uh, they often prefer, so they're information barriers. And teachers often prefer to work close to where they live uh, in urban areas or in schools with specific characteristics, more advantaged schools, such as better infrastructure, more experienced teachers, more credentialed teachers. Uh, and more socioeconomically advantaged students. So uh, most evidence has found, and there's not a lot of research on teacher deployment, that information barriers and teacher preferences can lead to inefficiencies and inequities in the job market. So often what happens, teachers cannot secure a vacancy in their in, in more popular schools, and slots in less attractive schools or more disadvantaged schools often go unfilled. So just to illustrate this, uh, this is a map in Peru. You can see all of the red dots are vacancies that teachers have chosen during the job application process. And the yellow dots are vacancies that were not selected by any teachers. So you can see about 40% of the vacancies, and this was, I think, the job contest in two, 2018, were not selected by any, any teachers. Um, about 60% of disadvantaged vacancies or vulnerable schools had no applicants. Uh, just to show some ex extreme, 77% of intercultural bilingual vacancies, these are schools that serve indigenous students in Peru, mainly in the Andes, but also in the Amazon, were not chosen by any teachers. And if you look at an even more extreme case in Loreto, which is the re uh, region in the Amazon, 83% of vacancies were not selected by any teacher. However, you had have a lot of market congestion, a lot of uh, density of applications. So 32% of the chosen vacancies received over 10 applicants. So you have a lot of teacher sorting and a lot of market congestion. And this you can find in other places as well. Uh, what, what, this, what ends up happening is a high percent of applicants in the, in the process are not assigned to any vacancy. So in Ecuador and Peru, over 50% of applicants during the contest do not, get a, do not secure a vacancy. Uh, and this is actually very inefficient for governments because they have to reapply in the following contest. In Ecuador and Peru, they have to take all of the tests. Again, so it's, it's expensive for the government. In Ecuador, they have to take at least part of the tests as well. And this often leads to teacher, teacher sorting. So disadvantaged schools struggle to attract qualified candidates often resorting to temporary hires. And you can see in Ecuador, uh, the higher the school socioeconomic status, the higher the teacher's content knowledge. It's about one, there's about a one standard deviation between teachers in the highest and the lowest quintiles. And so governments uh, have adopted different policies to improve efficiency and to try to attract and retain teachers in hard to staff schools. So they've used monetary incentives to work in disadvantaged schools. There's some evidence in Peru. And we have, we have some evidence in Chile as well that these can be effective in retaining teachers in high-performing schools. In Chile, they're not as effective to attract teachers, but these are very expensive policies. In Peru, they usually represent about 30% uh, over the base salary, the, the teacher incentives. These are, these are quite expensive. We've also uh, tr uh, tr uh, tried low-cost non-monetary incentives. So we have two large-scale experiments, that one that we ran in Peru, another one that we ran in Ecuador, another one we're running in Peru actually right now 
as uh, this week, uh, using techniques from behavioral economics to nudge teachers or try to try to nudge teachers to uh, consider applying to some of the hard to staff and more remote and rural vacancies. We find that in Peru, um, focusing on extrinsic and intrinsic motivations increased the probability of including rural schools in choice sets and, assign and had an impact on assignments. And in Ecuador, the experiment that we ran on the job platform increased the share of applicants that included schools in their portfolio. That actually had even a, a, larger, a larger impact. So these, these are some low, other low-cost ways to attract teachers to hard to staff schools. But in this paper, we test a low-cost intervention that provides teachers with information aimed at increasing their chances of securing a position and seeks to improve system-level assignments, uh, trying to improve the scores of the pool of teachers that get jobs and the number of filled vacancies. So the, the, the intervention was implemented in Ecuador as part of the Quiero Ser Maestro program, which assigns teachers to schools through a centralized choice and assignment system. Uh, since 2013, the Ministry of Education has selected teachers and assigned them through a centralized process that has three phases. The first phase, they have, teachers have to pass a psychological exam and a knowledge exam. I think they need to get about 70% of the answers correct on the knowledge exam. Then they pass on to the next phase, where they evaluate their credentials and they have to do a demonstration class and they have to also pass the dem demonstration class. You can see that uh, about 27%, this was, in the, this was in 2019 when we ran this experiment, 27% of the almost 130,000 applicants passed. Uh, in Peru, actually the numbers are much lower. It's like seven to 10% pass. Uh, and then once uh, teachers pass, they go on an, uh, an online platform and they are able to, they have to select and rank up to five vacancies and then are assigned, they are assigned by an algorithm with similar properties to a deferred acceptance. Uh, and this uh, takes into account their scores and their preferences. So the teachers, I also should mention, this is kind of important for our experiment, uh, have uh, a 10 day application period and then a two day validation period. So what we did, so I have about six, six, seven minutes. I'm a little slow because I arrived last night, so I hope I'm coherent. Um, the, the, interve the intervention consisted of providing teachers with a personalized report. So we sent about 20,000 teachers via WhatsApp and email that included a summary after, they, after the 10-day application period and they closed and submitted their applications. We sent them a summary of their application that included the location of their school, the distance of the school from their home, the number of applicants and the number of vacancies at the schools that they applied to. So all of the teachers that applied received this personalized report. And then some of the applicants, uh, those that were at risk of not getting a vacancies received in addition to the summary, a warning and a list of recommended schools similar to those in the summary, summary se selection. So they received something like this that said, this can increase your chances of getting a vacancy. You're applying to schools that are oversubscribed and that have a lot of have other candidates that have better scores than you have. We recommend that you go back and add schools or modify your application so you can increase your chances of getting a vacancy. And basically to, to identify the risky applicants, we generated 200 assignments uh, simulations to, to determine the proportion of simulations in which applicants were not assigned. So risky applicants were those that were not assigned in 30% of the simulations. This is similar to previous work that Chris did in Chile on school assignment, and this generated a sharp discontinuity. Just really quick, and this is important, uh, on the note on the recommendations, uh, the, the risky recommendations were, what we did is we pointed the teachers toward, uh, in our list of recommendations towards schools that they had a good, better chance of getting into. So that they had, where they had higher scores than the other applicants. But we did not consider the general equilibrium effect concerns that some schools might end up more congested, congested if uh, they were recommended to many applicants. This, is, this will be important in a second. I'll show you the results. We did not, we did include as diverse uh, uh, a group of recommended alternative to reduce the risk of generating excessive congestion, congestion at the highly demanded vacancies. So we used a regression discontinuity strategy. Let's skip over this. Uh, we tested the validity of this using covariate tests. We'll see if I can, I can come back to this if you want, but I want to get into the results. 
Uh, what we found is uh, treated teachers were much more likely to modify their application and to be assigned to a vacancy. So receiving the risk warning increased the likelihood of applicants going back to the platform and changing their application. Usually the, this meant modifying, unfortunately, I, I can come back to this at the end, unfortunately this usually meant modifying their application rather than adding schools to their application because over 90% of, of teachers uh, uh, listed five schools on their applications. And Ecuador only allows teachers to list five schools. They should really allow them to list unlimited schools. Um, and this has some implications for strategic behavior. Uh, and also they added a recommendation for about 43% added a school from the recommended list that we sent them. And these are some other outcomes as well. Not at, if they added any modification, added any school, added a school from the recommendations list, uh, the, about 30 set, they had a 37 greater probability of being assigned to a school and then about a 35% greater chance of being assigned to a school that we recommended from the list. Uh, just I have about three minutes. So just, I wanted to show a couple other results. Um, first, and I think this is important for policy, um, there was a drop in the assignment in the probability for applicants. If you see on the left of this, the discontinuity, the partially assigned schools are schools before the last validation phase. So this is before they could go back and this is when they closed or submitted their application and before they went back and changed their application. So you see on the left of the discontinuity, they were more likely to be assigned um, and applicants on the right of this, the discontinuity after the validation phase were more likely to be uh, to to increase the, so what ended up happening in some they some of the applicants that we recommend or that we sent risk to were applying to oversubscribed schools so these tended to be higher performing candidates that were applying to oversubscribed schools they were displacing some of the lower performing candidates that were less at, less at risk so kind of a system level descriptive result. And this is very descriptive because we didn't design this experiment thinking about the GE effects. We just designed the experiment thinking about individual effects, increasing individuals' chances of securing a vacancy. But we did find that it increased the number of applicants and the overall assignment score. So the general quality of the pool of applicants that got that secured positions increased by about 0.23 standard deviations. So I think that's an important. Uh, impact. It's just descriptive. It's not causal, but I think it's worth mentioning because it's important for policy. So to, to conclude, I think I'm going to include, include on time as well. <laughs> we find that the effect that program, this loss, low cost information intervention in the context of Ecuador's assignment system had an impact. The results are robust to different specifications and lead us to conclude that the intervention positively, positively impacted individual choice and assignment to schools. So they were more likely to choose schools if they got a risk and choose from the list of recommended schools. So personalized information can impact and affect individual behavior. Um, the results also suggest, they're more descriptive, a positive general equilibrium effect by improving both the average score of teachers and the total assignment. So a greater percentage of teachers were got a job after this compared to, to previous contests. Uh, and it also increased the score of the overall pool of students, of teachers. So that's also, I, we also thought that was an important effect. So centralized choice and assignment system, similar to, to Quiero Ser Maestro contest, they provide a unique opportunity to interact with applicants and offer personalized feedback. And so we, you know, future work we think should consider the GE effects. And also, and this is something I didn't get into, but we can talk about in the Q&A, mechanisms rules. So uh, in, in Ecuador, in Peru, five seconds. In Peru, you, you can list unlimited schools in Ecuador, only five schools, and that does have implications. And just the, lastly, uh, you, there's also an opportunity to use new technologies to engage teachers during the process. So we're doing some of this work in Recife, Brazil right now, using recommendation engines to engage uh, students and uh, centralized choice platforms. And we also think you can use this technology is to engage teachers. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Now, Ricardo taking us to Mexico.
organizers for the invitation and everybody for being here. I don't see the presentation. It just, it's just thinking. Okay. So anyways, well, this is joint work with uh, Juan Bedoya and Rafa de Hoyos. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about teachers. And uh, oh. so I, in front of this audience, I don't have to elaborate on the point that teachers are a key input for learning. Uh, but even though uh, we know uh, teachers matter. I don't wanna distract you. <laughs> And many education uh, systems in developing countries struggle to hire teachers, effective teachers in a systematic way. And, uh, and, and that, that, that's a big challenge. I mean, we know teachers are important, then how do I get good teachers into schools? That's what we want to know. And uh, in Latin America, motivated in part by public pressure about the low quality of education, many uh, countries, including Ecuador, uh, Chile, and Mexico, have moved to basically what we call a rule-based hiring, which is the hiring of teachers based on uh, competitive examinations. In the case of Mexico, heavily based on standardized testing. And, and there are uh, some, several papers evaluating this, including one of mine that I presented in the very first RISE conference. In, in that paper, I showed that the introduction of rule-based hiring into Mexico leads to the hiring of more effective teachers teachers that, that add higher value added to student learning compared to the counterfactual of using the traditional system, which in Mexico means a highly discretionary uh, system and opaque. I will talk more about that, okay? Uh, so so, so that we have some papers that have uh, evaluated whether uh, this rule-based hiring uh, leads or not to uh, a higher student learning. In general, in Latin America, the results tend to show that are positive. But still, uh, we know for more uh, descriptive work that implementation of these reforms tends to be very challenging for political economy reasons. And, uh, and I think we still, know, we still have to know better why reforms uh, succeed or fail. And this is a little bit the motivation of this paper. So we know teacher quality is multidimensional. There are many things that make a good teacher. And we are going to study one of these dimensions in this paper. And that dimension is cognitive skills. There is some evidence by papers that show that teachers with higher cognitive skills tend to be more effective teachers and to add value, more, add, more value added to student learning. And in the context we're gonna study, which is Latin America, this is a little bit worrisome because teachers tend to have very low levels of cognitive skills. And this is something that uh, Maria and I document in a different paper. And I'm gonna just pick a graph from that paper to, 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 to motivate the context. So there we use this PIAC data, which is this survey of the adult population by the OECD that is like the PISA for the adults. And there are four countries of Latin America that participate in this uh, survey, including Mexico. And what we do is we compare the cognitive skills, the numeracy scores in particular of teachers and not teachers, of the tertiary educated population of, P of people in these four Latin American countries and what we call the high performing OECD countries. And when you compare the distribution of test scores, you observe two things. One, if you look at the panel on the left, uh, which is Latin America, it's uh, teachers are negatively selected in terms of skills compared to the population with tertiary education. No? The, the, the distribution of teachers is to the left than the other people, educate, tertiary educated people. Second, people in Latin America countries, the tertiary educated people tend to have lower cognitive skills than people in the OECD countries. Now the combination of these two facts, lower skills in the population and a negative uh, or well, a skills gap of teachers with respect to other uh, person educated produce a fact that I think it's worth to, to put attention. If you look at the vertical lines, this tells you the first vertical line, who are, what are the share of the population who is below a uh, proficiency level one of PIAC, which in Latin America means 50%, 15% of teachers. What does it mean? These people have trouble to, to, to calculating 30% to understanding basic, uh, a basic text, text uh, the, devoted for uh, at the level of the primary school level. 
So probably this, if this teacher had trouble making basic calculations and understanding basic texts, they're going to be hard for them to be effective teachers. The other one is a vertical line is a line at the performance level number one. And people below, they can manage to, to, us to calculate a percentage uh, number, but they have trouble putting this in context or, in, or as a part of another operation. So people here have limited cognitive skills and probably they're gonna be a limitant for their effectiveness, uh, effectiveness as teachers. So what we're gonna do in this paper is study the effect of a civil service reform in Mexico on the skills profile of new teachers. And specifically, we're gonna look at cognitive skills. I wanna bring more attention to the mechanisms behind this change. We're gonna look at self-selection and screening. And uh, the context is this nationwide reform that Mexico adopted in 2014. So in the 13, the Mexican group, Congress enacted a major education reform that basically revamped the teacher civil service system. It was a big uh, reform that changes many things in the selection, promotion, and permanence of teachers. And this included the, the, the mandate of using competitive examinations run by the federal government to determine hiring decisions, in basically all school, uh, public school system. And the reform aimed to put an end to this system characterized by a high use of discretion and opacity in the hiring of teachers. In Mexico, schools are run by the state governments. And what this reform did is it took away one uh, function that is selecting teachers, and it gave it to the federal government, okay? And this reform basically expanded in the scale of the scope a previous reform named ACE, which introduced teacher hiring. So let me show you this quickly in a timeline. So what we look uh, in the period before, from 2007 to 2013, is this first reform that introduced uh, rule-based hiring. But in this time, rule-based hiring was optional. A state would say, this year I would put into the competitive national examination 60% of our new vacancies, and I will keep 40%. And it was up to each state to decide which year. Completely. Uh, then the reform came, changes many things in the teaching career, including now you have to put 100% of vacancies. And what we're going to do is to compare the before and after. And hopefully, I will show you that uh, looking at mechanisms, we find evidence that the changes that we observe have some causal interpretation. Okay. So the data we're going to use is first, we're going to use the basically what is the payroll in Mexico. And using the payroll of teachers, we can identify who are the new teachers. Then we're going to merge those payrolls to the results from the competitive examinations, both before and after the reform. And in this way, we can identify who are higher through the competitive examination system. And those higher, other way, must come from the discretionary system. Okay? And the third we're going to use, this is important, our measure of cognitive skills come from a national standardized test that teachers took when they themselves were students at the end of secondary school. Okay, so in Mexico, to be a teacher, you need to have a university degree. And what we do is we look at people who enter the teaching profession, and we go and look back in time with data and at this result on this national standardized test that all the students take at the end of secondary education when they are around 18. Okay, and that's our measure of cognitive skills. So if, if we look at the new teachers hired through the 2012 to 2017 period, which is when we have data from the uh, payroll uh, data sets, which are new, we were created in this period, uh, we've identified around 180,000 teachers. Now, some, the average age of new teachers is 29. So some are too old to be found in this national standardized test that started in around 2006. So what we do is, is we focus on what we call recent graduates, which are young enough to be found in the standardized test, which is basically people who enter the teaching profession four years after finishing high school. And the university degree in Mexico typically takes four years. Okay, it's people uh, who are, uh, yeah, what we call uh, recent graduates. And I think this reason is uh, probably this creates that we underestimate the changes that we're going, we're going to observe because we're looking at a good population of, of the new teachers, let's say. So, okay, so we're going to just basically compare before and after. 
And as you imagine, there are many challenges for identification, and the basic one is secular trends or shocks of individuals who self-select the teaching. And hopefully we're gonna show uh, this is not a problem in our case. So when we compare before and after, we see an important improvement after the reform is implemented in the profile, uh, the skills profile of teachers, which is around three percentile points on average of the distribution of the skills. If we look at the quantile regression, we look at the most of the change come from the bottom part of the distribution. The change in the quantile 0 0.1 is almost between five and seven percentile points. So the change is really coming from the bottom part of the skill distribution. Then when we try to look what is behind this change, one very first thing we do is how the reform was implemented. And what we observe is a large increase in the share of teachers who are higher under the rule-based system, from 65% to 75% and up to 85 But this is not one. Why? Because there are many reasons in which the state governments react, basically using administrative tricks to prevent putting all uh, vacancies in context. And this is a common in other uh, contexts in Latin America. Second, we look at what happened between the skills gaps between the rule base and the discretionary hires. And we will say, what we observe is when the reform is implemented and the share of rule based hires go, goes up, and uh, we observe also an increase in the average quality of the teachers hired through the uh, rule based system. They become better. While the, the discretionary were becoming worse even from before. So the skills gap between the rule base and the discretionary higher widens with the, with the reform because the reform improves the quality of rule-based hires and there is a trend of uh, worsening of the discretionary hires and this becomes the less dominant system. So then we, when we look at the rule-based hires, because from them we have the pool of applicants. We know who applied to the system. We don't know for the discretionary system because there is no such a data set that uh, records who are the applicants to the system. But we know who applied to the discretion, to the rule-based system both before and after the reform. And we compare if there is a change in the self-selection of people to the main dominant mechanism to recruit teachers. And this can be a potential interesting mechanism of the reform, but can also illustrate if we are on not, if our main result might be driven or not by the self-selection trend. And we, what we observe, if you look at the panel of, on the left, is there is no clear change, basically, in the pool of applicants to this reform. Particularly, I think, is because we're looking at recent graduates, right? So there is little time to adapt and, uh, and change this. But this is good for the credibility of our main results. There is a small change when we look at the bottom, but it's around 1%. And if we look about the change in the quality of the rule base higher, this number is up to 7%. Uh, percentile points. So it's very little compared to the overall change. It's an, likely very modest at most to explain the main result. And so the, the, the question is why? No, I mean, we are observing that the quality of the rule base higher increases clearly just after the reform. And we don't observe that the quality of the applicants to the rule based process changes. So there must be, because these guys are screening better, are selecting better, are now better at producing teachers from a given pool of teachers. And that's what we study here. And what we do here is just we just plot the probability of being hired as a teacher for the applicants to the rule-based system. And we put the before, which is the ACE system, to the after the reform, which is the SPD. For time, I didn't go into the detail, but the reform not only made mandatory who is hiring, improved the institutions running the system. Wonderful. And that probably had an effect because we look how this, how this slope, it becomes much higher. Now, cognitive skills are a much more important determinant of hiring. And we find the same results if instead of using the probability of hiring, not the same results, but the same pattern, we use the test scores used to select teachers, to screen teachers. So the correlation between my performance at 18 and my performance in the test that I took at 22 to enter the, the, the teaching career becomes stronger with the reform that brought this institutional change about how these competitions are made. So to sum up, we find that the SPD reform likely improved the skills profile of new teachers. And mainly this is key, we think, by an improvement in the bottom of the skills distribution. 
And basically, we think that there are two channels behind this thing. The reform decreased the prevalence of discretionary hires, which were disproportionately drawn from the bottom of the skill distribution. And second, the reform improved the screening efficiency of rule-based hiring, making cognitive skills a more important determinant of hiring outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Jonathan, I'm so sorry. They say they need to reset the system, so it'll be a couple of minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of questions from the room on the other three papers and look forward to hearing what okay. future release very soon. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to do first round of questions in a bit of a swapped order. So, yep, um, I'm going to try to take three questions, and I'm going to ask strictly one question per person. If there's more time, then we can come back to you if you have more. But yes, I see one hand there. Any other hands? Any questions with this? One and okay, so let's go one, two, three. Okay, it's like... okay, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophia. I'm a teacher. So, my question is So, um, my question is about how do you can be assessing how the is Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so uh, the reason I asked about it is because I was a housemate who did uh, a teacher training college in the UK. And I remember like students who say because like he was like super stressed since the first day I ever met him. Uh, it was because he has to fight for like school placement during teacher training stay. So basically, I think it's like doing this like uh, really getting into education, he had to go through like so many school placements. So everybody wants to get into like the good schools. So everybody's ready to compete. During the placement stages, because if you get to this, like, for example, like, if you in the district and uh, during your uh, school placement, then you will have a higher chance of becoming like a permanent teacher. Vicky, can I ask you to jump to the question? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll go here. Oh, right. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> uh, that's a question for me for the first presenter. I was wondering about the potential anticipation of this policy, meaning that schools may have been incentivized to fire the least productive teachers shortly before they receive the suitable protection, which would create a bit of selection of the group that is then. Um, going to the okay. 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 So, uh, very boring question to Maria about identification as well. I'm just thinking that if the probability of dropping out uh, increases by five percentage points every year of experience, the difference in difference in the robots could just be mechanically driven by those. Uh, more experience is not like to drop off, but I'm sure we have responses and answers. Great. Okay, so let's do Gregory first. What's that? Oh, yes. Sorry, actually, can panelists, can you come up to the front? Sure. Uh, Ricardo Maria, could you come up to the front here? Can I ask a question for Maria while we walk up to the front? Uh, <laughs> yeah, why not? You can, you can use part of your time to respond. So then Maria and then Ricardo, you have the joy of making any comment or reaction you want. Great. I was just curious about the net effect, like what you thought was the net effect of this policy change, because you found that it decreased teacher turnover, which is really costly for systems, especially mm -hmm. in the early years, but at the same time decreased productivity. So if you were talking to, you know, a government, what would you what would you suggest? Sorry, can you okay. also briefly respond? Yes. Uh, so your question was about pre-service training. That was one question I had for you. I uh, uh, think because in Ecuador, it's after pre-service. So when, when teachers graduate from their undergraduate treat teacher training programs, they have to go through a selection process, kind of similar to what Ricardo explained in Mexico, with multiple instruments, with different phases, and then they apply to schools. Um, and so I, I guess in, in the UK, it sounds like they go, they, they apply when, 
as they're finishing their undergraduate teacher training? Is that... um, so I think my understanding is that you do like a course called PGCD, which is by how so you do your undergrad and had to do like a particular professional certificate called PG, uh, PGCD in order to kind of apply to schools. But during the training of PGCD, some uh, of the professors are allowed to come in to get more experience. So that's part of your uh, I mean, yeah, I don't really know exactly how I need, need more information, but one thing that we've been working on with, with other governments in Latin America is centralizing their processes, because some of these processes are very costly to manage for governments. They have to process all of the applications, they have to interview the teachers, they have to find placements for them, they have to often negotiate with them, there's a lot of discretion, like Ricardo described, and so these are very costly processes, so one thing that we've working on with some governments is how can they centralize the process where they can apply online with a platform same rules for everyone they can rank their preferences they know exactly the rule that they're going to that's going to be used to determine if they get a position or not and then we have some of these techniques like the one we mentioned now to kind of reduce inefficiencies in the process so because what happens like like with your roommate everybody applies to the same schools there's they're popular emblematic schools or really popular schools that everybody and they become oversubscribed and often teachers don't get vacancies so that's kind of the the rationale behind some of the things that we're doing but in that sense what we've been working with lots of lots of different places states and municipalities in brazil is how can they centralize the processes and this reduces costs, but at the same time uh, increases transparency. It doesn't always uh, increase efficiency in the applications, and that's why you need more information to reduce some of these information barriers. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to move some. Maria, you have three questions. Asked. I'm going to ask you to be brief. That means yes. you get to pick and choose. I'll be brief. So about uh, pre anticipation effects, the law was passed at the beginning of 2015, but it was conditioned on seniority at mid-2014. So schools had, would have had to react at the beginning of the 2014 school year in anticipation of that. And we don't see any pretrends and it's consistent with they're not being able to, to, to do that. Then the other question, we compare teachers with three and two years of experience, like in a repeated cross-section fashion. So if there's differences in turnover by experience, that would be captured in the pre-trend in the previous years. So we, we control for that in that way. I don't know if I, if I answered your question. And for you, the net effect, I would say like, on the one hand, you're lowering turnover, uh, which is good, but, of, but you want to lower the turnover of the good teachers, not of the bad. And it's actually like costly. You're retaining people forever in the system who have bad performance. Um, and so my recommendation to policymakers would be like, perhaps you want to have these dismissal protection type contracts, which is a very common civil servant uh, feature, but you should do it based on performance and not seniority, which is like, something that it's, uh, unions pressure for, but it's very costly to do. Great. Go <laughs> Before we go to you, Ricardo, just an update on panel structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next few minutes wrapping up Q&A on the Latin American teacher career structure papers. And then for the last 20 minutes, we'll get Jelmeth her 15 minutes to present and do Q&A for her. Um, yes, so accidentally segregating the papers, but yeah, um, actually, Ricardo, I'm going to take a question from Barbara Bruns because I know she's written about, I think, pretty much every topic here in most of the countries. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll come to you, I promise. Yeah, Barbara, go ahead. Um, oh, I didn't see Barbara. Uh, it's still not working. So. Yeah, just. <laughs> okay, I'll speak um, One of the things that there is some degree of evidence, including from Ricardo's earlier work on the Tele Secundaria uh, questions when the, there's a partial towards the rules they say. But one thing that's striking about the Latin American cases is that the, the main, the only filter for teacher quality is at the point of taking these, you know, hiring tests. And, you know, one thing you see in Peru, Ecuador is it's very low pass rates. So if you contrast Latin America with other, you know, high, you know highly developed countries that have great education system, Finland, you know, East Asian countries, there's a lot of filtering that actually is high quality. And there's some cases like Lucente Mas that uh, exit exams for teachers to, to get a degree qualified So Chile is the only country of the Europe group that I think has been working actively on that issue to try to restrict the number of teacher training schools to 
make sure that they're qualified. And so, uh, is that anything like that happening in the other countries? And uh, and what, well, how would you assess the impact in Chile so far? Um, anyone else want to jump in on this round because it's likely the last opportunity for asking questions. Yep, go ahead. The microphone is working. Now. <laughs> Progress. Um, thank you for the three papers. I had a I had a question. Well, a uh, question for Maria and question for for Ricardo, which is a political economy question. Uh, you both sort of swept the political economy under the rug, and I wanted to hear a little bit more uh, about um, why in Chile they chose to use um, performance uh, seniority and not performance, um, and why it was such a struggle to implement in some states in Mexico and not. And a very like simple empirical question related to that: um, How noisy? is performance year on year within a uh, teacher. Okay, so I'm gonna give Ricardo prime the prime place for answering. And then we have in total four minutes. So then Maria and Gregory, you have to fight it out for the last couple of minutes, but yeah. So try to, to, to go to Barbara's question and making a connection with, with, with the last one. So I, I would say we cannot take for granted that Latin American countries are going to keep moving towards more professional uh, uh, civil service systems that look like those in their developed countries. There, is, there was certainly a trend, a wave which we observed, and many of us have studied, in which they are adopting uh, systems to regulate entry into teaching uh, profession. And as you say, in Chile, entry into the uh, teaching and uh, training schools. But for example, in Mexico, in 2018, the reform that I was and discussing, even though there is evidence of the important effect on teacher quality was canceled when a new administration came from. And that uh, relates to the political economy question. It was very unpopular with the union. Two reasons. One is the discretion of the previous discretionary system was uh, criticized for uh, abuse of discretion that would lead to selling of position, to hiring of relatives, of teachers who are as part of the system, and that's part of a political machinery which, in which the union would play an important role in politics. So it was a bold reform to take. This reform included not only uh, evaluations to entry the professions, but also to stay in the profession, which was um, very unpopular with the union. And, 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 a new, and a presidential candidate was able to manage this anger and finish this reform. And I think, to me, in, in a more uh, general way, one important lesson of the Mexican experience is that you may have reforms that are technically very good. And I think this reform, if you look at it technically, it was designed very well. I mean, but then you have to make it as important or more. How do you create the political environment in which there are stakeholders that are going to support this new equilibrium? And that's key. And even when I was talking about implementation, but at the beginning of this reform, there were several implementation errors that made teachers uncertain about their future in a way that the, the reform didn't contemplate and that increased the opposition. So I think implementation and the political economy, the, the part, the work of creating a coordination and a dialogue that create that helps to support these reforms are key. Okay, thanks, Ricardo. So, Maria Gregory, 30 seconds each. You go. Oh, are you sure? <laughs> yes. Uh, just to address Barbara's question, I think it's really important. So, there are trade offs between focusing on uh, the quality of pre service training. Places like Peru, they didn't focus on that, probably because of the political economy. It's really difficult. Institutions have autonomy, so they focused on selecting teachers into the profession. And so in Chile, they, they, they kind of are doing both uh, in both now, but there's also a trade-off. For example, in Ecuador, uh, at a few years back, they closed some of the institutos pedagogicos. Um, and this had a, an impact on access on, on the supply. So in some areas in Ecuador, you don't have teacher training institutes. They have to go to Cuenca or Quito, especially for teachers in Amazon. So I think there's a trade-off and um, and it, it depends a lot on the political economy. And answering the question over there about the political economy, what I think happened is that they just emulated a regularization process that happened in like 1999. So they just hopped onto that previous law and said, let's change instead of 1999 is 2014. Uh, 
So that's one reason why they did it based on seniority. And I just think like probably political pressure, there was like a, they were changing the, the teaching career at that time. And I think maybe it's like just to give a concession. This is my personal opinion, to give a concession to the unions and some, or something like in this already moment in which they're implementing a lot of reforms, that could have been something. And on your question of the noisiness of the teaching evaluations, I, I don't have I'm going to ask you to take that I to the coffee cut break. It now. That's Thank you so much, Ricardo <laughs> Maria Gregory. And we're going to go to Jelnit online. Jelnit, are you ready? I hope we can hear you this time. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm so, so relieved okay. to hear. Thank you, all Thank yours. You. Great. Thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to be presenting here. My name is Jelnit Kaur, and I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Teachers College on the job market this year. So this paper is about teachers' beliefs and how these beliefs impact behaviors and student learning. So to begin with, it's empirically established that teacher effort is a strong determinant of learning. Systematic reviews of evidence point out that teacher-driven interventions are the most effective for improving learning as opposed to interventions led by, say, schools, communities, or technology. And it's not just the selection margin per se. We also know that teacher effort has a direct and causal link with student learning. However, do teachers themselves think that their effort matter matters for learning? Unfortunately, no. Surveys across multiple developing countries show a consistent pattern, a high share report that their effort has limited impacts on student learning. And so to give you a flavor of what these beliefs look like in the survey data, the figure on the left is um, summarizing data from nine developing countries. Uh, this is work by Shwetlana Sabarwal and others. On an average, 40% of teachers either agree or strongly agree with the statement on top, which says there is little I can do to help a student learn if parents are uneducated. On the right is data from the Young Lives Survey. More than 60% of teachers in India agree I am very limited in what I can achieve because a student's home environment is a large influence on his or her achievement. And this is also consistent with anecdotal evidence presented uh, in Pritchett 2013. It's not uncommon in these settings for teachers and even school leaders to publicly admit that disadvantages at the student level are difficult to overcome. And so therefore, teachers have a limited role to play. And so why should we? care. This is a concern because we know that these are settings with high shares of disadvantaged learners. And we also know that beliefs about the productivity of one's effort are important for influencing effort and investment decisions. So in this slide, these, these, uh, this descriptive evidence generates worrying implications for teacher effort learning. A person standing in the front of the room believes that my effort does not matter, then it's it's hard to uh, see how, how that will uh, actually translate into real effort. So in this paper, I ask two research questions. One, are teachers' beliefs about the productivity of their effort malleable? Can we change them? And two, how does targeting these beliefs impact teacher effort and student learning? To answer these questions, I use a field experiment in India across a rural school chain. And to target teachers' beliefs about the influence of their effort, I use a psychosocial intervention, which is grounded in positive psychology, to specifically use to target beliefs about the mapping between effort and learning. So the setting I work in is with Akal Academy schools in Northern India. I work with 83 schools, 292 teachers and 6,000 plus students. Um, I randomize within schools at the teacher level. Uh, given the variation in assignment status within schools, there's a risk of potential spillovers. So because teachers in the setting are typically more likely to interact with their colleagues from adjacent grades, I attempt to reduce the risk of spillovers by including teachers only in the non-adjacent grades. So for this study, we have math teachers from grades two, four, six, and eight. And so the intervention that I use to target teachers' 
beliefs about perceived control is a psychosocial intervention de developed by World Being, which is a nonprofit that has that develops evidence based modules grounded in positive psychology for disadvantaged populations. Also, this intervention has been used by uh, Maddie McElvey in another setting outside education and has been found to be effective in influencing people's uh, self-efficacy and locus of control. So in practice, what the intervention looks like, it's a medium touch intervention. It's a five week training with two sessions per week conducted remotely over Zoom after school. The treatment group receives the psychosocial intervention. Um, and this intervention, essentially, the curriculum uses skill building and control enhancing approaches. So as you can see, um, the modules on the left, the, the modules first build awareness of participants about their strengths, the character strengths, and then also impart skills such as goal setting, problem self solving, to help them develop more confidence about their abilities to influence outcomes. Um, and off note, the curriculum has no discussion about teaching skills or classroom practices. This is to minimize the scope for experimental demand effects. So this training is packaged as a general training for pers personality development of teachers. Um, while the, uh, I also have a placebo group that receives a training in the similar structure and format, but with uh, purely informational content uh, unrelated to personal development. So the study was conducted over the academic year 22-23 with four rounds of data collection at baseline. Um, I had the intervention around in September, followed by three rounds of end line, uh, one month after the intervention, three months later, and then six months later. And each data collection round involved uh, in-person visits by field team, collecting teacher surveys, conducting classroom observations, um, while also collecting administrative data on student learning. So a core challenge um, in this area is the measurement of beliefs. Using self-reports may not always be credible because teachers have an incentive to misreport. So to incentivize truthful elicitation, I devise a novel real stakes task using a multiple priceless procedure. So what I do is I ask teachers to make a sequence of contract choices to receive a bonus at the end of the year. And each choice is between a flat bonus or receiving a performance linked bonus that links payoff with test score improvements of low performing students. And the choices can keep the flat pay option fixed, but incrementally increase the stakes of the performance pay contract. So the idea is I use information on the switching points to elicit teachers' beliefs about how much control they perceive over education production. And to make sure that teachers understand this task, I uh, walk them through guided examples and a sample question along with comprehension checks uh, for um, to ensure that they understand the task. So this is the choice that was presented to teachers. As you can see on the left, um, is a fixed amount of rupees 1,000, which is unconditional. On the right is, is double the amount, rupees 2,000, but with strings attached. It's conditional on increasing test score of a low-performing student in the classroom by some amount. And as you go down the rows, what's changing is the amount of test score increase required for the payment to be received. So in practice, teachers choose the right-hand side option for the initial few rounds and then switch to the left-hand left, left -hand side option at some point. And, and I use this switching point as a revealed preference measure of how much teachers believe they can influence student learning. So how many uh, test score points do they believe they can influence through their effort alone? So one concern is that this choice could be capturing maybe risk preferences, which uh, beyond teachers' beliefs about their abilities. And so to tackle that, I also independently measure risk attitudes and control for these. Um, moving on to effort, I capture multiple dimensions of effort. First, I um, capture effort at the extensive margin by collecting data on teacher attendance. Uh, second, I capture effort at the intensive margin by conducting classroom observations. So these observations are conducted by trained observers. 
um, who score teachers on objective measures of effort, which are hard to manipulate on the spot. So I, um, I basically curate uh, a classroom observation tool adapted from uh, multiple international instruments um, and extensively piloted in the setting. Uh, I also pre-registered this tool and uh, combine all the measures into a single summary index on which uh, I examine the impact. Uh, thirdly, um, as an additional measure of effort, which is not subject to Hawthorne effects, I also conduct reviews of homework notebooks of students. So this is a, essentially capturing a measure of past effort. Um, and these notebooks are scored for whether these are checked, the kind of feedback that's provided, whether it's detailed feedback or just generic feedback, um, whether it's encouraging feedback uh, or, or, or neutral. And fourthly, I also collect data on time use and whether teachers engage in after school tutoring. So moving on to the results. Um, so first of all, the experimental integrity that the randomization balanced most observables at the teacher and student level at baseline, except for teacher education, which I control for in all my specifications. Um, attendance tracking shows compliance with experimental assignment. On an average, teachers attended 50% of the sessions and attendance was balanced across both the groups. Um, the, the, the first result on teachers' beliefs, so I find that the intervention shifted beliefs as capital by the reveal preference measure. So here, my dependent variable is the switching point, the row in which the participant switched from the uh, performance linked option to the, to the flat pay option. I see that treated teachers have later switching points compared to control teachers. And this is even after controlling for risk preferences. And so this effect translates to around 1.5 points on the test, which is around 7% of a standard deviation for student test scores. In other words, treated teachers are more confident about their ability to increase test scores by an additional 7% of a standard deviation. And relative to the control group, this is a 23% increase in confidence. Um, Moving on to effort, I do not see any effects on the extensive margin of effort, uh, so, so on attendance, but of note, attendance is already much higher in the setting. Um, these are private schools, although these are rural and operate in low resource context, these are private schools, so the attendance is already high. Um, I see strong positive effects at the intensive margin of effort as captured by the pre-registered summary index of effort. I see that treated teachers score 0.13 standard deviations higher on this index, and the effect is significant at the 5% level. And decomposing this effect, I find that um, this is majorly driven by treated teachers exerting more effort at facilitating engagement and also adopting better pedagogical practices. So I had measures in the tool uh, capturing effort at facilitating eng engagement, such as whether the teacher um, makes an attempt to engage the backbenchers in the class, um, how many students are called out by name. So it seems that um, treated teachers are more likely to uh, make efforts at um, engaging students in their classroom. Um, Further, I find, I find positive effects of 0.1 standard deviation on grading effort, and this is majorly driven by treated teachers providing more detailed question level feedback to students. Um, moving to time use, so I asked teachers to report um, how report the time that they spent on an average day uh, on four different activities. I do not see any effects on class preparation, time spent on class preparation, but I, I see that treat, treatment teachers spend more time, around eight minutes Hello? additional time checking notebooks Janet. compared to control teachers. Sorry, yes. just, just a warning, you've got one minute and 50 seconds. Okay. Okay, um, so moving on to the most important results on student learning, I see that students taught by treated teachers score 0.08 standard deviations higher in the end of year exams. These exams are independently proctored and externally graded. Um, and moreover, I find that these learning gains are broad based. So even though the incentives are geared towards the bottom half, the gains are broad based, both the bottom half and the top half of the distribution gain from the intervention. 
I do not see any heterogeneity by student demographics. Uh, did the intervention impact other channels apart from beliefs? I do not see any effects on mental health, growth mindset, or teachers' expectations of students. But um, on the contrary, I find that beliefs are a more plausible mechanism as corroborated by additional measures um, captured in the self-reports as well. So to conclude, um, this, this work finds that teacher teachers' beliefs can serve as a powerful lever for changing teaching practice and raising learning levels. I find that teachers' beliefs about how much their effort matters are malleable, and that targeting these beliefs raises teacher effort and leads to broad-based gains in student learning. Um, a direct policy implication of this work is for teacher professional development programs in developing countries. Typically, it's found that teacher training programs don't work, and it's, it's not clear why these don't work. Um, this work, through this work, I propose perceived control or beliefs about the mapping between effort and outcome as one explanation for um, uh, the ineffectiveness of these programs. And this also suggests potential for scaling, um, scaling up these training programs through large scale professional development um, curriculum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect timing. Okay, um, I'm gonna stay here for Q&A, so hopefully the cameras can show John with the whole room. Um, John, if we're just gonna take one round of questions first, and then we'll go from there. Sorry, more tech difficulties. Okay, I see one question here, and then we'll go here. Any, anyone on the side of the room? Okay, and then Devyani over there. So let's start here. Hey, hi, Jalnit. Great presentation and great study. Um, I was wondering if you have collected data on like dosage effects, like for example, data on whether teachers turn their Zoom like camera on, how attentive they were in the Zoom like sessions, because it would be interesting to see if there are dosage effects associated with the treatment, like teachers who were more attentive, either like in terms of just their attendance or by more engagement, if they had a stronger treatment effect. Great, thank you. And there's one over here. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you had any comments on the generalizability of these results, given if these teachers are being, if the intervention is happening in 2022 and 2023, teacher beliefs may be quite low after the pandemic anyways, um, considering their effect on students in comparison to the home effects. And then we had Devyani. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jalnit. Very interesting presentation. Just a quick question on you. When you, In the beginning, you alluded to the fact that teachers' beliefs of how students perform are based a bit on their background, right? And we know in India, that means you come from a certain community or from a certain, certain socioeconomic background. So did you analyze that? Because I know you went quickly over your demographic slides. So I wasn't able to see what you looked at there. Was there any effect uh, based on students' socioeconomic background or which car? Uh, they come from, I think, very clear in, in Punjab that that demarcation is there. Okay, thanks. And John, because you only have one opportunity given time, I'm so sorry to answer this. I'm going to take one final question and make it very quick. Just okay. Uh, hi, Janit. Uh, first of all, brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, just wanted to ask a question. So it, uh, the treatment also involved some sort of financial, like the incentivization was financial in nature uh, with which the teachers, you were measuring how teacher effort changes at each milestone. Uh, wondering, uh, and this was a low cost private school setting, uh, I'm assuming, um, something like this to replicate, and this is a generalizability point, how, could, how would you replicate it across a, say, a public school setting in India where this kind of incentivization won't be possible? And does it also mean that any other for, form of incentive, we would be able to detect similar sort of uh, effect? So you're just wondering about that. Okay, great. John, as you can see, people are very excited about your work, bodes well for the job market, but just pick and choose. Yeah, you have one and a half minutes. I'm so sorry. Thank you for all the questions and thank you for so much uh, engagement and interest uh, in my work. Um, okay, starting with the first question on dosage, I do collect data on uh, um, the degree of participation, whether uh, 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 teachers switch on their Zoom cameras and um, how much they are uh, active in the chat, but I'm yet to analyze this, uh, but that's a great suggestion. Um, so so this is these results are forthcoming. Uh, on the generalizability bit, um, 
so I think the first question was about this is 2020, 2022, uh, 23, and uh, teachers' beliefs might have been lowered due to COVID. So the motivating data that I showed earlier was, was from 2016, 17 Young Lives, and also from the last decade collected by Shvetlana Sabarwal. So it seems like those beliefs were independently low before COVID, and they might have gone down further. Um, and um, to the extent that this intervention works, I think this this um, the fact that uh, COVID could have led to uh, a, a downward shift in these beliefs. It just raises um, a possibilities for, for higher scope for such interventions uh, in the future. Um, and then coming to the question about um, SES and CAST, uh, I do not find any heterogeneity in uh, effects on student learning by SES. However, I was not able to get access to data on CAST. So this was not available in the school registers. But um, apart from that, I, I did have um, data on other student demographics, uh, in, uh, also whether um, they were receiving financial assistance. And I do not see any uh, heterogeneity in effects uh, by, by those characteristics. So it seems like everyone across the distributions stood to gain uh, from this intervention. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for a wonderful discussion. So on to coffee and conversations, and we're back in half an hour. 11 o'clock on the dot. 11 o'clock on the dot. Thank you.